Amy stepped out of the restaurant and the cold evening air slammed against her face, causing her to lower her head and hunch against the chill. Although she lived quite a far distance from the restaurant, she always walked home because she could not afford the extra cash for the train. Watch it! Someone banged into her, almost sending her sprawling to the floor if she didn't right herself at the last minute. She sighed in exasperation, forging forward, even though all she wanted to do was stand up for herself and cuss him out. He had banged into her. He was the one at fault. But what could she do? Whip out her pad and hit him with it? A wry, self-deprecating laugh escaped Amy's lips as she turned into the decrepit part of town. Here, the houses were hanging on by a thread, waiting for one strong wind to topple them to the ground in a gust of cement and dust. As she neared her house, her steps slowed, and she took a deep breath, trying to fix a smile on her face so Nana didn't suspect anything. That woman worried too much, and Amy couldn't afford to stress her about anything because she was the only family left. She arrived at her front door, attempted another smile, and walked into the house. It was an ailing one-bedroom apartment with a rickety bed that she used to share with Nana. These days, she preferred to sleep on the couch. Amy! Nana shuffled out of the bedroom with her walking stick. You're back? Nana was the only person who spoke to Amy, since everyone else believed she was deaf, and Amy never corrected that speculation. Yes, Nana. She signed her response. You're back early, Nana says, narrowing her eyes. You don't usually come in until eight. Is something wrong? No, Amy answered. I'm just a little tired and want to rest. Okay? Okay, Nana nodded. I made dinner with the items we have left, but there's nothing left for us to eat once this is finished. Do you have some money to stock up the cabinets? Amy's heart slammed in her chest at the indirect reminder that she was the breadwinner of this family and could not afford to be unemployed. I'll stock it up tomorrow, don't you worry. She kissed her nana on her way to the bathroom. You'll always have food to eat as long as I'm alive, okay? Nana smiled. Go shower, I'll plate your food. Things were not actually okay for Amy. She found herself in a tight spot again, losing her job as a janitor at a local restaurant. It wasn't a shock or a cause for panic. More of a nuisance, really. This time, they said she was stealing, a claim she knew was baseless. For the past six months, Amy had actually enjoyed her role. Unlike typical jobs, hers didn't chain her to endless hours of toil. She often found pockets of time for her real passions, writing and sketching, all with the green light from Mike, her initial boss, who appreciated her work ethic. However, the atmosphere shifted dramatically with the arrival of Carla, the new boss. Suddenly, every little thing Amy did was under scrutiny. Despite the tension, Amy tried to give Carla the benefit of the doubt, thinking maybe she was just trying to make her mark. All Amy wanted was to get her work done without any fuss and head home. Carla seemed less interested in bridging the gap. I expect things to be done a certain way, she replied curtly, leaving little room for the understanding Amy hoped for. This new dynamic made Amy's daily routine more about navigating around Carla's criticisms than about the actual job she used to enjoy. Two weeks into Carla's reign, Amy faced a startling accusation. Upon arriving at work, Carla met her at the door with a chilling directive. Leave now. The police are on their way. Puzzled, Amy demanded an explanation, only to be forcefully led into the office. There, Carla presented security footage, claiming it showed Amy stealing. The evidence was merely Amy carrying out an empty wine box, its lid adorned with a picture of a bottle. Carla pointed to this image, accusing Amy of theft. Remaining composed, Amy tried to clarify the misunderstanding, insisting the box was empty 
and she hadn't taken anything. Carla, unyielding, maintained that inventory was missing and advised Amy to leave, promising to tell the police it was a mistake. With no choice, Amy walked out, her integrity questioned over a baseless claim. Amy's life had often been shadowed by misunderstandings and unjust judgments. Initially, she attributed people's coolness towards her to her disability, believing it made communication awkward. However, as she grew, Amy recognised it wasn't her disability that set her apart, but her striking looks. It was an ironic twist of fate. The very aspect of her appearance that could have been a source of admiration instead fueled envy and conflict, complicating her interactions and relationships far beyond what her disability ever did. The next day after she was fired from the restaurant, Amy woke up at the usual time by 7 a.m. She showered, changed into her work clothes, and ate breakfast before kissing Nana's cheeks and leaving home. As she walked up the road, she wondered where she could go now that she was unemployed. It crossed her mind fleetingly that she should go beg manager Williams, but she knew that wouldn't work. Not when Diana and Chelsea were still there, they would continue to sabotage her, and it would only be a matter of time until she lost the job again. As Amy trudged up the road into town, she reminisced on her life and the series of mishaps that led her to this very point. She wasn't born dumb. For the first five years of her existence, she lived an ordinary, lucky life with her parents and two beautiful older sisters. One day, they all got into the car, heading to a newly opened water park to have fun as a family like they usually do. On their way, a drunk truck driver rammed into them head-on, sending their vehicle into the air. The last thing Amy remembered was the harrowing look on her mother's face before everything went black. She woke up without her parents, without her sisters, and without a voice. Shortly after, she was shipped down to the town to live with a grandmother she had never seen before, and the quality of her life dropped. It had been 20 years, and Amy didn't remember her life without suffering and strife. She managed to finish high school, but that was how far it went. Nana didn't have enough money to send her to college, and no one was willing to employ Army and pay her enough to save up for college because of her disability. She had to forfeit her college dreams and resort to survival mode. Even in survival mode, it was hard for a mute girl. She saw her friends go off to college and become engineers, doctors, accountants, and have other respectable careers while she remained stuck shuffling between some odd jobs. It took a toll on her self-confidence and for a long time, she hated herself for surviving the crash. If she had died with her family, she would have been at peace. This world was too cruel, and she was too much of a coward to do anything about it. Janitor needed. Call and the number. Amy stopped by the flyer. She couldn't possibly call the number because she couldn't talk, so she skimmed the paper for the address and hurried to the train station. The company hiring was Archer Ads, one of the biggest advertising companies in the country, and it was located in the luxurious part of town. Even as she walked into the building, Amy knew she was in over her head. There was no way she would get a job here. Aside from the fact that they would never hire a dumb and deaf person, Archer Ads was farther than the restaurant and there was no way she could walk to and from home every day. Yet, curiosity made her stay, and she turned in a full circle, taking in the opulence of the building, and to think she was just in the reception. Upon completing the full circle, she bumped into someone and heard a loud thump as something clattered to the natural stone floor. Shoot! It was a phone, and Amy reached down to pick it up before looking at the person she smashed into. 
Her eyes widened when she met the hostile eyes of the most beautiful, stylish woman she had ever seen. The woman was tall, her hair quaffed back in a tight bun that caused her eyes to slant upwards. She wore expensive clothes, and her sweet-smelling perfume permeated the air between them. Amy cleared her throat as the woman snatched her phone. And who are you? Her voice was just as Amy expected. Sharp, luxurious, and unwelcoming. Amy whipped out her pad and scribbled on it. My name is Amy. I am deaf and dumb. I'm here to apply for the position of janitor. Please give me the job. I promise to give my best. She was used to this form of communication, so her fingers flew over the page like a flash, and she was done writing in seconds. When she looked up, the woman's mouth was upturned in an irritated snarl. What is this? Are you dumb? The question was an insult to most people, but was a necessary introduction for Amy. She nodded and held up the pad, directing the woman's attention to it. Amy watched her eyes fleet over the page for a moment. A deaf and dumb janitor? she echoed. Do you have any experience? Then she rolled her eyes. Why am I speaking? She cannot even hear me. Amy started scribbling again. This time, the woman groaned. Look, I don't have the time. I'm on my way somewhere. Amy blinked, her heart breaking. It wouldn't be the first time someone would be too impatient to wait for her to get her words completely out on paper. Still, it hurt. You're close enough so I can read your lips. You asked if I have job experience. Yes, I have worked many menial jobs. I can be a janitor. She held the pad up. Without glancing at it, the woman sighed. You look so pitiful. It will hunt me for the rest of my life if I turn you away, even if that's what I really want to do. Amy held her breath as the woman looked at her phone and back up at her again. Here's the pay. The woman flipped the screen at Amy. Does this work for you? Amy's eyes widened and she swiped a hand across her eyes before refocusing on the figure on screen. It was double the amount of money she was making at that damned restaurant. It would be enough for her to take the bus every day, keep the kitchen full, buy Nana's drugs, and any other bill that might surface. Tears threatened to fall. The woman sighed impatiently and started to type on her phone. Resume on Monday, ask for David, He'll show you what to do. Amy nodded, and the woman breezed past her towards the exit. Suddenly, she stopped and looked at Amy again. I'm not going to cut you any slack because you're deaf and dumb. If I catch you lazing around, I will kick you out. She froze and groaned. Shoot! I keep forgetting she cannot hear me. Ugh, thank God I don't have to deal with her after today. She disappeared out the door. Despite her hurtful parting remarks, Amy could not help but feel gratitude to the woman whose name she didn't even know. This job would change her life. Amy was sure of it. The next morning, Amy dressed up modestly and tucked her hair away under a baseball hat. She wanted to make sure she is not drawing any unnecessary attention. By 8 a.m., she was walking briskly across the expense of the reception towards the counter. The receptionist was dressed as smartly as everyone else in the company, and she looked at Amy with a smile. Good morning, Mom. How may I help you? Amy took a moment to absorb the friendly smile because she knew it would fall the moment she brought out her pad. Like she called it, Amy set her pad on the counter and the receptionist's friendly demeanor changed. Ignoring her, Amy wrote, My name is Amy. I can't hear or speak. I'm the new janitor. I need to speak with David. The receptionist eyed her for a few seconds before writing down her response. Take the elevator, third floor, first office. Amy smiled at her and headed to the elevator. She felt particularly lucky today, and nothing could bring her down. The office to the first door on the fourth floor was open, 
and Amy peeked in to see a robust man sitting at the desk, drinking coffee from a mug. There was a name plaque on the table that said, David Fisher. She knocked on the door and walked in, holding her pad poised to introduce herself. My name is Amy, the new janitor. David narrowed his eyes. Oh, you're the one Linda talked about. She mentioned that... He paused and narrowed his eyes. Oh, she can't hear. Great. This was the right moment for Amy to correct the misconception that she was deaf, yet she stared blankly at David, choosing to go with the slow. People have called her deaf all her life. Why change it now? David sighed and rose to his feet, grabbing a jotter and pen. She followed him out of the office, down the hallway and into a locker room. There were other janitors here, dressed in a uniform blue jumpsuit. Listen up, David clapped his hands to draw their attention. This is Amy, he said. She is the new janitor. Please share the schedule with her and show her around. Hello, Amy. She can't speak or hear, David said. Don't waste your breath. Then he turned to the lady closest to him. Anna, go and grab her a uniform that fits. The lady hurried off. David finally turned to Amy while writing on his jotter. These are your colleagues. They will show you around. Let me know if you need any help. Nod if you understand. Amy nodded, her spirit still light and elated despite the aloofness of everyone she had met this morning. With a final glance in her direction, David stormed back towards his office. Anna returned and handed her a blue uniform, then showed her to the changing room. After changing into the ugly blue jumpsuit, Anna shared the schedule, and she was officially ready to work as a janitor in Archer Ads. Her first duty was to clean the chief editor's office, and Amy headed there excitedly, thinking about all the things she could do with the money when she got paid. Anna had written out the directions to the office. And now? Amy stopped in front of it, staring briefly at the chief editor plaque on the door before turning the knob and walking in. Two women were seated at the table, engrossed in quiet conversation, when Amy entered the room. Their heads turned in unison, eyes tracking her movement. The brunette in particular seemed to take a keen interest in Amy, her gaze lingering noticeably as she assessed her from head to toe, an unreadable expression playing across her features. Excuse me, can you not knock? The brunette growled. And judging by her position at the head of the table, Amy figured she was Naya, the chief editor. She quickly showed them her pad, introducing herself as the janitor and explaining she could not hear. She's deaf, Naya screeched. Oh my gosh, Linda will employ any Tom, Dick and Harry who comes here looking for a job. The other lady laughed. Don't sweat it. You're going to become the assistant MD soon. We... We're not alone, Jane, Naya motioned to Amy. Refrain from making such statements until it's the both of us. Jane waved Naya's concerns off carelessly. She is deaf, remember? She can't hear a thing. Poor child. And she's so pretty. Naya laughed and eyed Amy with slight irritation. Well, pretty or not, I don't want to be in her shoes. I'd be so miserable if I could not hear or talk to people. As they conversed and made her the butt of their hurtful jokes, Amy worked, managing to tune them out. She wasn't here to be liked by anyone. All she had to do was her job. It had been a few weeks working in Archer, and Amy had gotten the hang of it. She started work by eight in the morning and closed by four in the afternoon every day. It was stressful, but she never complained, seeing as she had no choice and the pay was good. As usual, everywhere she worked, most of her colleagues didn't really like her, and the workers in the company, well, they were starting to eye her again. If there was one person Amy tried to avoid the most, it was Naya. So when she arrived at work that morning, 
and saw Clean Chief Editor's Office as part of her itinerary, her mood dampened considerably. Naya had never spoken directly to her, but that didn't stop her from making snide and hurtful remarks because she thought Amy couldn't hear. These jokes hurt Amy so much. Amy! Warm arms surrounded her, and she turned away from her desk to smile at Anna, the only person in the company who treated her like an actual human being. How are you, Amy? Why the long face this morning? Anna wrote. Sometimes Amy wanted to tell Anna that she wasn't deaf, contrary to what everyone thought. But what was the point? It wasn't like she could talk back. She scribbled her response on the pad. Nothing. Just found out I'll be dealing with Naya today. Anna frowned. Do you want time to handle it? We can change schedules. Amy perked up. Really? You would do that for me? Yes. Come on, smile. You don't have to deal with Naya if you don't want to. Amy was about to scribble a thank you response when another one of their colleagues joined them. His name was Marvin, and Amy had never spoken to him before. Ignoring her, Marvin looked at Anna. Why do you bother yourself talking to her? I imagine the conversation must be so boring with all the scribbling and writing you have to do. It's so weird. As usual, the remark bounced off Amy, and she pretended like she didn't hear. Anna glared up at Marvin. That was rude. Please, stop talking about her like that. Come on, Marvin rolled his eyes. It's not like she can hear what I'm saying, see? He turned to Amy and waved, forcing a smile on his face. Amy smiled back at him and waved back. Marvin smirked at Anna. Told ya! You are disgusting! Anna grabbed Amy's arm and led her away from Marvin. Amy already accepted that she was a magnet for doom and misfortune, so when her afternoon went sideways, she took it in stride. That morning, Anna exchanged schedules with her, so rather than heading to Naya's office to clean, Amy got the MD's office instead. So happily she went, grateful that she didn't have to deal with Naya's toxicity, even if it was for one day. However, halfway into cleaning, the office door opened and someone stepped in. Amy looked up to greet the MD, but froze in shock when Naya strolled in, a designer bag swinging in her hands as she headed to the desk. Halfway to the desk, she saw Amy and her face marred into disgusted annoyance. Gosh, why do I feel like this rag is following me everywhere? She cried. What are you doing in Axel's office? Amy stared at her. After all, she was deaf. Naya didn't expect her to answer that. Anyway, it was a silly question, because what else would she be doing in Axel's office with cleaning supplies? Naya's frown turned ugly, and she marched towards Amy. You are such a pathetic little... Naya! A deep, authoritative voice slashed through the tension, and Naya jumped back. Axel, hey. A beautiful smile carved her face. I didn't know you were coming in so soon. Amy slowly raised her head and met Axel's gaze from across the room. He was huge, with a commandeering presence, and dressed fashionably, decked head to toe in designer. His face was carved in planes and sharp edges, giving him the most uniquely gorgeous face she had ever seen on a man. He smiled, and it took a brief second for Amy to realize the smile was directed at her. She lowered her head. The click of footsteps broke the silence in the office, and before Amy realized Axel was approaching her, he was already standing a few feet away. Hello? She cannot hear you! Naya bit angrily. She is deaf and dumb. Is that why you bully her? Axel's voice remained cool, but the underlying edge of steel could not be missed. I didn't tag you for a bully, Naya. Naya floundered for a bit before she recovered and tried to save face. She almost spilled dirt on my shirt, she lied. 
That's why I got out of character. But it's just a shirt, Axel said gently. I'm sure it can be washed. You're right. Naya lowered her lashes, looking like the perfect picture of remorse and regret. Amy didn't believe her one bit. Axel did because he smiled at her and walked towards the desk. Quickly, Amy packed up her supplies and ran out of the office. She was brimming with questions, so when she found Anna during their break, she bombarded her with everything. Who is Axel? She hurriedly wrote on her pad. He's the MD. Why? Anna wrote back. He seems to have influence, and he's close to Naya. Oh yes, he's also the CEO's son, heir to Archer Ads. Did you see Naya today? Amy took a few moments to jot down everything that happened between her, Naya, and Axel. By the time Anna finished reading, her eyes were as wide as saucers. Wow! I didn't know Axel was so kind. I've worked here for years, and he's never spoken to us. Lucky girl. Amy bit down on her lips as a hot flush crept up her cheeks. Maybe she wasn't so unlucky after all, she thought, remembering how Axel smiled at her. Anna gasped and scribbled something on her pad before showing it to her. You are blushing, Amy. You have a crush. Shaking her head, Amy pushed away from the table and ran into the privacy of the locker room. She might be dumb, but she wasn't stupid. Axel was only being nice to her. There was no way he would have looked at her twice on an ordinary day. Nana, are you all right? Amy walked into the bedroom and crouched beside the bed, where Nana was still lying. It was past seven, and if Amy didn't leave now, she would be late for work. But Nana had been acting weirdly since last night, and Amy thought she might be sick. She touched the back of her hand to Nana's forehead and frowned. It wasn't burning up, but it was warmer than usual. Something was wrong. Nana. The woman's eyes drifted open, and she smiled as her focus zeroed in on Amy. Honey, why haven't you left for work? She asked. You're going to be late. Nana, are you sick? Of course not. She struggled to sit up, and Amy noticed her hands were shaky. I'm just exhausted from all the cleaning I had to do yesterday. Can you please stop? Amy signed. I've told you not to do anything around the house. I can always clean when I return from work. But you'll be so tired, Nana insisted, her watery eyes gleaming with laughter. Don't worry about me. I'm already worried, Nana. Amy shook her head. You're the only family I have left. I can't lose you. You won't. Nana kissed her cheek. Now off to work. You don't want to be late, do you? Get up. Amy reluctantly left the house, her heart squeezing in her chest. Nana looked paler than usual this morning, and it might be time for one of their irregular hospital visits. She had saved some money from the last two salaries she received from Archer Ads, and it might be enough to foot Nana's hospital bills. The only problem was time. She worked Monday to Friday, and today is just Tuesday. Can Nana wait four more days to be taken to the hospital? It's been three months working in Archer Ads, and Amy wouldn't say she loved the place, but it was good, better than every other place she ever worked. It was the money. Everything else stayed the same. The hateful co-workers and wicked bosses, Amy was used to them. The only people that were nice to her were Anna and Axel. She didn't rein into Axel often, but whenever she did, he always took his time to say hi and ensure she was okay. Each encounter with him chipped away at her heart, but Amy knew it was only pity on his side and nothing else. Look at her, someone said. I wonder how she survives without being able to talk or hear anything. She must be so miserable. Amy didn't flinch. Instead, she remained by her locker like she didn't hear them. The girls continued. Do you think she has a boyfriend? Ooh, 
Who would date her? They laughed. I mean, she's pretty and all, but she's like an empty void. I can't imagine anyone being in a relationship with her. Amy swallowed. Good call, girls. She had been single all her life for this reason. Do you think she moans during sex? One of the girls asked. Or does she just lie there like a log of wood? Bridget, the poor girl cannot talk, the other girl responded. Of course she can't moan. Have you seen how she and Anna communicate? They have to write every single thing. I can't imagine how Anna copes with it. Must be so boring. Although Amy was used to these types of comments, today was different. At first, she let the words bounce off her skin, but soon, the more the girls talked, the more their words started to stick, and she couldn't shake them off. They were right that the quality of her life was impacted drastically by her disability, yet she just wanted to be treated like a human being for once in her life. Tears slipped down her cheek, and she stuck her face into her locker to hide them. This wasn't the time to be weak. She needed to be strong for Nana, especially now that Nana was getting weaker each day. Where is Amy? Over there, one of the gossiping girls quickly supplied. Hearing David's voice made her freeze, and she quickly wiped off her tears. Since getting this job about three months ago, he had never spoken to her. Even when he called the other janitors for a meeting, he always excluded her. She was fine with it since Anna always briefed her after each meeting. What changed? Why was he looking for her now? A pad was pushed in her face and she turned away from the locker to look at David, who was glowering at her. The words on the pad said, In my office. Now. As David stormed towards his office, Amy followed, her heart wrenching painfully within her ribcage. Whatever the issue was, she knew it couldn't be good. She shut the door behind her and waited by the desk as David scribbled angrily on his pad. When he was done, he held the pad up. The chief editor, Naya Matthews, just left my office. She complained that you never clean her office well and that any time you clean, something of hers goes missing. The latest being her diamond earrings. Where is it, Amy? Amy's eyes widened, and as the words registered, shock gave way to anger. I didn't steal anything from her. Then I'm sure you don't mind your locker being searched, right? Amy nodded, desperate to prove her innocence. She could not lose this job. By the time she and David walked back to her locker, the entire office had gathered there, with Naya telling everyone how Amy stole her diamond earrings. Amy's heart broke at the disgust and disappointment on everyone's faces. I didn't steal anything, she wrote on her pad, but no one was paying attention. Her gaze found Anna's in the throng, but to her hurt, Anna looked away. Open your locker, David commanded, and Amy unlocked the compartment. Everyone quietened as David shuffled through her personal items, searching for a pair of earrings that Amy had never seen. Tears stung her eyes again, and she couldn't wait for all this to be over so she could return to work. Are these yours? David took out a pair of earrings, and Naya nodded. Yes. That's mine, she cried, and snatched it from David. I told you she stole it. She's a thief. As the entire office erupted in loud shouts and angry swears at Amy, she stood frozen, devoid of emotions. Someone had planted the earrings in her locker. It had to be Naya. What else has this evil witch stolen? Someone said. Maybe she's the thief who keeps stealing my lunch. The angry shouts increased. What is going on here? Silence descended again when Axel appeared in the crowd, his worried gaze on her. Amy lowered her head because she didn't want to see the exact moment 
his worry would change to disappointment, disgust, and then hate. She is a thief, Naya accused. You don't have to defend her anymore. I told you she's a bad person. What happened? I always notice that whenever she cleans my office, something goes missing. It's been happening every time, and yesterday, it was my diamond earrings. I couldn't let it go because it was expensive. I reported to David, and we checked her locker. We found it. I see. Axel's calm voice washed over Amy, and she wished the ground would open and swallow her whole. Amy, you are fired, David said. Pack your things and... Who gave you the right to do that? Axel spoke. The crowd started to murmur, and Amy frowned. What did he mean? Did he want to fire her himself? So, sir, David faltered, she stole the chief editor's diamond earrings. She should be fired. Axel? Naya's voice shook with fury. She stole my earrings. And you found it, Axel responded. So what's the matter? I purchased these earrings for $10,000, Naya growled. What if we didn't find it? What if she had sold it? So many what-ifs for diamond earrings you already found. Axel never raised his voice, but his authority always forced people to listen. Or what do you want? He persisted. I will forward $10,000 to you so you can forget this happened. His words shocked everyone, especially Amy. She looked up at him, her eyes glassy with tears of shock. Why was he willing to pay $10,000 to keep her in the company? The tears spilled down her cheeks when she realized there was no disappointment in his eyes, only understanding. Naya growled and stormed away in a gust of anger. Axel narrowed his eyes at her disappearing back before turning to David. You're not being paid to search lockers and loiter in the hallway. Everyone, get back to work. The crowd dispersed grudgingly, leaving her and Axel in the locker room. After one final glance, he turned and walked away without another word. Anna found Amy hours later towards the end of her shift. She was in the cafeteria wrapping up her meal when Anna slid into the chair opposite her. Hey! Amy looked up, unsure of how to handle the situation. Anna had blended in with the crowd this morning and continued avoiding her throughout the day. Hi, Anna. Anna smiled and started to scribble on her pad. Amy waited until she was done. I'm so sorry, Amy, for not standing up for you earlier. I was so scared of Naya and David. Amy sighed and responded. I didn't steal those earrings, I swear. I know, Amy. I believe you. Amy sighed. It was still worrisome that someone tried to implicate her and get her fired. She wasn't even a threat to anyone. So why did they feel like their life would be better if she weren't in Archer ads? Someone tried to implicate me, she wrote to Anna. Who could it be? Could it be Naya? Amy thought about it for a moment and then shook her head. Naya was the company's chief editor. There was no way she would be so bothered by a janitor that she would plant her earrings in the said janitor's locker. I'm not sure it's Naya. She's the chief editor. She might hate me, but I'm sure she's not so bothered by me. Then who could it be? Anna asked. I don't know. A lot of people hate me. It could be any one of them. Anna bit the inside of her cheeks and began to scribble again. A lot of people might hate you, but... Guess who doesn't? Amy peered at the pad and narrowed her eyes thoughtfully. You? Yes, me, and most importantly, Axel Archer. Amy's face heated up and she lowered her head to keep the blush at bay. She hated how she came undone at the mention of Axel, especially because she knew she was being delusional. Rolling her eyes, she scrambled to get her thoughts on paper. Stop it, Anna. That's the CEO's son. He's just being kind. 
If you say so, but he's the one person who is never afraid to stand up for you, regardless of who is watching. I think this is beyond being kind. Axel likes you. Since Axel walked away from the locker room this morning, she hasn't caught a glimpse of him. Amy wished she could explain that she didn't steal the diamond earrings, but he didn't give her that chance. Yet, he had advocated for her to remain in the company. The thought gave her a headache, but she forced it out of her heed and concentrated on the moment. She was thankful she had another day at Archer Ads and hoped whoever tried to implicate her never did it again. That weekend, Amy took Nana to the hospital, but was relieved when the doctor said it was only a mild sickness and then prescribed drugs to combat it. By Monday morning, Nana was doing considerably well, and Amy went off to work feeling better than she had in weeks. When she walked into the Archer Ads building, she was reminded of last week and how she almost lost her job, but she quickly put it out of her mind and went to the locker room to change. Thankfully, only Anna and a few other people were in there, and there was a certain urgency in the air that had Amy wondering what was happening. She hugged Anna, then she whipped out her pad to ask, What's going on? Seems like everyone is in a rush this morning. Yes, there's going to be a handover today. Archer Ads and Baltimore Leltide have been in a tough battle for the number one ad spot in the country. Today, there will be a match between them in the conference room. Whoever wins buys the other company. It's a tough one. Amy's mouth fell open and her mind immediately strayed to Axel. If Archer Ads lose, we lose the company to Baltimore? Yes, sadly. Amy knew that there was a chance that Baltimore might kick out a dumb janitor from their midst if they won, and suddenly she became terrified. Her fear wasn't for herself alone. She feared for Axel, who would lose everything he ever worked for in the blink of an eye if the worst happened. Anna scribbled on her pad and shoved it in Amy's face. Quick, change into your uniform and meet me in the conference room. We must clean because the meeting starts in two hours. Amy nodded and slipped into the dressing room as Anna hurried off. She changed into her uniform and locked her compartment before running off toward the conference room. As she rounded a bend, she felt the hair on her neck rise and jerked her head back, only for her gaze to collide with Axel's, who was standing across the hall on the other end of the stairway. She froze. His eyes held hers and slowly traced down her body and back up in one single glance. Suddenly the temperature dropped and sweat dripped down her spine. Someone grabbed Axel's shoulder, whispered something in his ear, and pulled him down the hall into the next office. Just like that, their gaze broke, and Amy realised she was standing in the middle of the step, panting after a man. Embarrassed, she continued her journey to the conference room and joined the cleaning team. When it was time for lunch, Anna and Amy headed to the cafeteria together. Amy wanted to order pasta, a dish she was used to, but Anna convinced her to try rice and pepper stir-fry for the first time. This is so good, Anna wrote. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Since Amy was in a jolly mood, she opted for Anna's recommendation, and the girls sat down to eat. The meal was great, but it was so peppery that Amy's mouth was on fire halfway into it. She frowned at Anna. Why didn't you tell me it was hot? Anna playfully rolled her eyes. What did you think the pepper stir-fry meant, dummy? Amy laughed and pushed the plate away to down an entire bottle of water. Meanwhile, Anna continued to eat without breaking a sweat. Amy's stomach rumbled and she grabbed her pad. Excuse me, I have to use the toilet. This is all your fault, you wicked witch. While Anna laughed, Amy ran out of the cafeteria and into the toilet. Twenty minutes later, having received everything in her stomach, Amy walked out of the stall and into the restroom to wash her hands. She was still leaning over the tap 
when the toilet door burst open and Naya walked in with her friend Jane. Upon seeing her, Naya's face pulled back in an ugly scowl. Gosh, I hate this bitch! Amy continued to wash her hands, pretending she didn't hear Naya's vile words. Relax, Naya. She doesn't even speak or hear. What did she ever do to you? I don't know. Naya marched towards the wash hand basin, carefully leaving enough space between her and Amy as she looked at herself in the mirror. I think Axel likes her. Axel, Jane screeched. Axel Archer? What other Axel do you know? Naya growled. Yes, Axel Archer. I've been coming on to him for years, but he doesn't look my way. Yet he's always taking sides with her. Well, Jane scratched her head. Then he deserves what we're about to do to him, she said. Just look at it as taking your revenge. Yes, Naya smiled. When our plan becomes successful and I become assistant MD, I'm firing this dumb bitch here and I'll make sure Axel begs me for a spot. Amy froze. What plan were they discussing? Let's go over the plan again, Jane said. We can't afford to make any mistakes. Don't worry about it, Naya said. James Giovanni will do the bulk of the job. I have stolen Axel's presentation, so he won't have anything to present when it's his turn. I've helped James prepare an amazing ad sample, and without Axel, he will win. It's such a simple plan. There can be no hitch. Amy kept a neutral expression on her face and stepped close to Naya to use the hand dryer. She felt the weight of the girl's gaze on her back and persevered until her hand was dry before walking out of the restroom. As soon as she was out of eyeshot, she ran to the cafeteria but didn't find Anna. Frustrated, she retraced her steps to the locker room, relieved to see Anna by her compartment. Quickly, she took out her jotta. Anna, who is James Giovanni? Anna frowned. He's the MD of Baltimore Lentide, Axel's rival. Everything clicked, and Amy realized that Naya was trying to sabotage the company. She couldn't figure out why exactly, but it hurt to think that if she didn't do something about it, Axel would suffer. He had done too much for her, it would be unfair for her to sit back and let him fall. Still, she didn't know what to do, especially as a girl with speech impairment. Why do you ask about Jamie? Do you know him? Anna asked, and Amy shook her head. I've got to go, Anna. See you later. Of their own volition, her feet took her towards the conference room where the meeting was underway. She knew the longer she delayed, the riskier it was, Yet fear paralysed her. Would Axel believe her? Would anyone believe her? What if everyone thought it was a scheme to get back at Naya for outing her as a thief? As these thoughts raced through her mind, her heart beat wildly in her chest. She would take the risk, no matter what the outcome might be. Axel was worth it. She walked towards the mahogany door of the conference room, her heart in her throat. Just because she had made up her mind to do this didn't mean it wasn't scary. Only the thought of Axel kept her legs moving until she stopped in front of the door and wrapped her fingers around the knob. With a deep inhale, she twisted the knob and pushed the door open. The conference room was huge, with a long table in the centre and people dressed in chic, fashionable dresses seated around it. A man was standing on the centre stage, holding a microphone. When Amy entered the room, everyone turned, their confused gazes on her. She realised a little too late that she was still wearing the ugly janitor's uniform. Please, escort her out, someone said. We don't need cleaning until this is over. The security men stationed around the room started to walk towards Amy, and she shook her head, wishing she could speak. Wait! Silence descended the room again, and Axel stood, gazing at Amy. She walked slowly towards him, 
aware that the spotlight was on her. Before she reached Axel, Naya appeared beside him, eyes wild with fury. Axel, you realize we are in the middle of an important meeting, right? She fired. This isn't time to play with your little toy. The company is at stake. When Axel didn't respond, Naya grabbed Amy's arm and jerked her toward the door. Get out of here, you pest! You're like a virus! Let her go! Axel lost his cool, causing Naya to freeze. Let her go now, Naya. What is going on here? A tall, lean guy appeared beside Axel. Axel, this is causing a ruckus. Can this be postponed until the meeting is over? Just a minute, James, Axel said distractedly. He snatched a jotter from the table, but Amy beat him to it by scribbling, I can hear, speak to me, on her pad and holding it up. Axel's eyes widened, and Naya curiously stepped in front of the pad to read her note. Her eyes bled with fear, and she suddenly went raucous. Security! Get her out of here! Now! The security men started walking toward Amy, but she knew Axel wouldn't let them get her, so she started writing down everything she heard in the bathroom while Naya shouted the conference room down. No one else said anything, and it felt like the entire room held its breath as Amy scribbled on the jotter. She was about to hand the pad over to Axel when Naya attacked her by pushing her to the ground. The pad fell, and Naya was about to grab it when Axel held her back. Security, he growled. Hold her still. Axel, Naya yelled when the security men locked her arms and held them gently behind her, preventing her from moving. Axel helped Amy up while grabbing the pad off the floor with the other hand. Amy held her breath as Axel read her note. By the time he was done, his eyes smouldered with anger. He turned to James, who was still standing beside him, confused. Are you done? James asked. Can we continue our meeting? Yes, Axel gritted his teeth. We shall continue right after you tell the room about the plan you made with Naya Williams. James staggered back, his eyes flitting around the room as chaos erupted from the other members. I don't know what you're talking about, James said. Mr. Axel Archer, a well-dressed lady stood. This is becoming strange. Who is this lady who interrupted our meeting? And what plan did James and your chief editor concoct? Thank you, Miss Rivers. Axel nodded at her. This is exactly what happened. He told them everything Amy wrote in the letter. Shock and disappointment filled the room, but James shook his head. That's a lie. It's all lies against me because he fears I will win. Who was the other person in the restroom when this happened? Axel asked Amy. You wrote that Naya was discussing with a friend. Amy's gaze roamed the conference table until she found Jane, who had her head lowered, trying to make herself smaller and unnoticeable. Amy bit back a smile and pointed at her. It felt good outing these wicked women, especially after the pain and hurt they caused her. Jane Francis, Axel growled. Immediately Axel mentioned her name. Jane rushed to her feet. I am sorry, please, sir, she begged. It was all Naya's advice. Shut up, Jane, Naya shouted, but Jane was too far gone to care. All she wanted was to save herself. She planned with James to steal your presentation and help him win. In exchange for what? Axel asked. He would make her assistant managing director in the new merger, Jane answered, crying. And what about you? Axel probed. What did she promise you? To make me the head of the editing department, she cried. Forgive me, please. I was greedy. While Jane cried, Axel turned to Amy with a slight shake of his head. Thank you for this, Amy, he said. I don't know how to thank you. You literally saved my life. 
Amy smiled and scribbled on her jotter. You always stand up for me. It's only right I do the same for you. Thank you. With that, she walked out of the room, content and happy for the first time in forever. By evening, everyone had heard about what happened in the conference room, and Amy had become a celebrity in the twinkle of an eye. She had not seen Axel since she left the meeting room at noon, because he'd been so busy trying to get Naya officially removed from the company for stealing his presentation. Internal investigation also found that she had been disclosing the company's secrets to its rivals. The police left a few minutes ago, taking Naya and Jane. James was also going to be prosecuted for his crimes, since Naya didn't do it alone. Amy was in the locker room with Anna, who kept staring at her in disbelief. I cannot believe you can hear, Anna said. I don't know whether to be happy you can hear, or sad that you didn't trust me enough to tell me. She slapped Amy's arm and glared. And you are so brave, I cannot believe you walked into that conference room and called Naya out on her bullshit. Who are you and what have you done with my shy little Amy? Amy laughed and scribbled on her jotter. Sorry I didn't tell you I wasn't deaf. I've just adapted to it so it skips my mind sometimes. Does that make sense? No, Anna eyed her. And I'm tempted to never speak to you again. But you're a celebrity now, and I'm proud to call you my friend. So I'll stay, but don't forget that this is a friendship of convenience. Amy rolled her eyes at her friend's theatrics. Before she could respond, a deep voice interrupted their conversation. Excuse me? They turned to see Axel standing a few feet away. He was smiling despite looking stressed. Can I talk to you? He asked Amy. Anna immediately disappeared, and Amy lowered her head when Axel walked closer. Hi. Hi. Look at me. Slowly, Amy looked up, meeting his eyes. To her embarrassment, she felt herself grow hot as a blush crept up her face. I'm sorry for everything Naya did to you. I know she set you up with the earrings. David confessed it to me earlier. He'll be punished too. Amy smiled, relieved that he trusted her. She nodded and he continued. And about what Naya said, his voice dipped lower. On you being my toy, that's a lie. Amy's breath hitched in her throat. You are not a toy to me, Amy, he said. I like you a lot. What? Amy scribbles in her journal. Why? Why do you like me? Because you're different, he answered. I cannot explain it, but your aura is beautiful, and I want to be around you always. I know it's a shock, and I'm honestly not trying to bombard you with this information, but I'd like you to go home tonight knowing I like you very much and would love to be with you. Amy smiled. Unlucky? Where? Amy Hart was the luckiest girl on the planet. She picked up her jotter and did the bravest thing she had ever done. I like you too. Axel's eyes lit up with joy when he read her note, and he nodded. Can I take you out tomorrow? I have work, she returned, shyly biting her lips. Axel rolled his eyes and sidled closer. Have you forgotten I'm the boss? He tucked a strand of hair behind her ear. Come on, say yes. Amy's hands flew over the page as she replied to him. Yes, I'll go out with you. Axel pumped his fist into the air. I'll see you tomorrow. Be ready at noon. He turned to leave, then stopped halfway, a shy smile on his face. Oh, I didn't get your address. Shaking her head playfully, Amy scribbled her address on paper and handed it to Axel. He stared at it for a moment and slipped it into his breast pocket before walking away. Amy sagged against the locker, her heart beating wildly in her chest. The following day, Amy sat nervously on the couch, her heart beating in rhythm to the ticking clock overhead 
as it neared noon. A nervous part of her terrorised her with thoughts of Axel not coming as he promised. What if he stood her up? Her palms turned sweaty and she wiped them on her skirts. Amy, Nana called gently. You haven't told me why you didn't go to work. I'm getting worried seeing you sit there staring at the clock like you're doing a tarot reading. Are you okay? Amy sighed and made the I'm okay sign. She never hid anything from Nana, but this time she hesitated. If Axel didn't come for her, she wanted it to be a personal embarrassment. When the clock struck 12, there was a knock at the door. Amy rushed towards the door and yanked it open, sighing in relief when she saw Axel standing outside in a fashionable shirt and chinos, holding a colourful bouquet. Compared to him, she looked ordinary. Yet, he looked at her like she was the only woman in the world. Amy, you are beautiful. Amy smiled, and realising she didn't have her jotta, she ran back into the house to get it, almost running down Nana in the process. However, Nana didn't seem to mind. Her attention was fixated on Axel. Who is this handsome gentleman? She pushed the door wider. Please come in. Pardon Amy's manners. Axel walked into the house, took Nana's hand and kissed it. My name is Axel. I'm Beth, Amy's grandmother, Nana said, a dull blush on her cheeks. Amy narrowed her eyes at how easily she fell for Axel's charm. Amy didn't mention a grandmother, or I'd have brought something, Axel said, glancing at Amy. Amy, this is for you. Tears sprang to her eyes, and she took the bouquet. She didn't even have a vase, but no one had ever gifted her flowers, and she stared wondrously at them. Axel turned to Nana. I like Amy very much he said softly. She's wonderful and kind. You raised her so well. Nana blushed again. Thank you, Axel. Where did you two meet? Axel narrated everything to Nana, and Amy listened as he talked about how spellbound he was on the first day he saw her. When he was done, Grandma sighed dreamily. We have to go now, Nana. Amy scribbled on her jotter. See you soon. They bade Nana goodbye, and Axel led her to his luxurious car that was parked outside her apartment. He held the door open and helped her in before getting behind the driver's seat and pulling the vehicle out of the space. Some minutes later, they arrived at a private park, and Amy was surprised when he unlocked his booth and took out a picnic mat and several coolers of food and drinks. A smile blossomed on her face, and he scratched the back of his neck shyly as he looked at her. It's a bit quiet here, he said. I hope you don't mind. I want to get to know you more, and I thought it'd be a good place to start. Amy nodded, amazed at his efforts. She had gone on a few dates before, but none where the guy put so much effort into dating her. One time, a guy took her to a karaoke bar, Axel laid the mat on the grass and helped her onto it before hefting the cooler's clothes. I didn't know what exactly you liked, so I brought a little bit of everything. He opened the coolers and began to arrange the food on the mat. I'm sure by the time this date is over, I'll know everything about you. Amy laughed and joined him in offloading the food. Just like he said, there was a little bit of everything. Sandwiches, pies, scotch eggs, sausage rolls, chicken drumsticks, grapes, cheese and crackers, and bananas. There were also an array of drinks, pineapple juice, daiquiri, sangria, lemonade, and punch. Amy's mouth watered. She had never seen so much food in one place. So what do you like? Axel asked, staring at the feast before them. Amy scribbled. Everything. Axel nodded impressively. My kind of woman. Let's eat. As they ate, Axel talked about everything, and it helped Amy relax and feel more comfortable with him. 
he talked about all his favourite things and his childhood experiences and soon started asking her questions. What's your favourite colour? He asked and then held out an arm. Wait, let me guess. Blue. Amy's eyes widened and she grabbed her jotter as she stuffed one grape into her mouth. How do you know? Axel winked. Your outfit is never complete without a touch of blue, he said, and then reached out to touch her scrunchie. Like this. It's always subtle, but the consistency can only be maintained by someone who loves the colour. Amy laughed and shook her head. You're right. I love blue. You see? He nudged her playfully and moved the bowl of drumsticks toward her. You haven't tried this, he said. It's delicious. Amy picked one and tore into it, sighing when it melted on her tongue deliciously. It's so good. Told ya! Axel grabbed a sandwich. What about your parents? Dead. His eyes widened and he dropped the sandwich. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to. No, it's okay. We're getting to know each other, aren't we? He sighed, his eyes still clouded with worry. We are. But I know how hurtful the death of a parent can be. How would you know that? Amy asked. I lost my mom to an accident ten years ago, he said. On some days, you feel like you've healed. And on some, the pain cripples you. You're absolutely right, Amy agreed. My parents also died in an accident. It's been over 20 years, and I still cry sometimes. Life would have been so much more different if they were around. I'm sorry, Amy. Me too. Silence descended upon them again as they ate, but it was comfortable. Together, they cleared the platter, and by the time they were done, they fell into the grass, laughing hard. Amy turned her head, only to catch Axel staring at her. She grabbed her jotter to tell him the one thing she had never told anyone before. You know I wasn't born mute? What? He sat up, frowning. What do you mean? I was in the accident that claimed my parents' life, Amy explained. And so was my elder sister. Everyone died except me. When I woke up in the hospital, my voice was gone. Axel narrowed his eyes. What did the doctors say? They tried their best, but nothing worked. Amy shrugged. When he drove her home later that evening, Axel and Amy felt closer to each other than ever before. They knew the favourite things about each other, and Amy regained the confidence she had lost in herself. Axel stopped to buy a necklace for Nana and Amy couldn't wait to see the joy on Nana's face when she received it. It's been years since Nana got anything new. Nana opened the door to them half an hour after they left the picnic, her weathered face wreathed in smiles. Oh, you two, you both look so happy. Come in. They walked into the house, and Amy hugged Nana, tears pricking her eyes. Did you have a great time? Amy nodded, pulling away. I got you something, Nana, Axel said excitedly, withdrawing the jewellery box from his pocket. Nana gasped and reached for it, her grey eyes bright with joy. She opened the box and sighed dreamily. Axel, this is too much for an old lady, she said. No. He firmly shook his head. Nothing is too much for Amy's Nana. Excited, Nana offered Axel dinner, and to Amy's surprise, he stayed a little longer and ate before leaving. The next time Axel would come to pick Amy up on a date weeks later, he had learned a little sign language. She opened the door and Axel said, Hello, Amy, with gestures. Tears immediately clouded her vision, and she flung herself into his arms. Axel kissed her hair and hugged her closer. This unexpected closeness made her blush, Axel grabbed her hands, peering intensely into her eyes. A few moments later, 
Amy found herself seated beside Axel in a serene park, their hands intertwined, reveling in the tranquility that surrounded them. Listen, Amy, Axel began with a warmth that enveloped her. I truly admire you just the way you are, and it's not my place to push you towards anything you're uncomfortable with. However, I've taken the liberty of arranging a consultation with a highly esteemed doctor. He's renowned across the country for his expertise. I hope this doesn't overstep, but I felt it was worth exploring. A wave of emotion washed over Amy as Axel's words sank in. It wasn't the mention of the prestigious doctor that touched her, but rather the profound sense of being seen and valued. After years of feeling overlooked, the genuine care and attention Axel was offering felt like a balm to her soul. The journey to this moment had been nothing short of miraculous, marked by small victories that culminated in a transformation that neither of them had dared to fully envision. The doctor's appointments had been a tapestry of hope and perseverance, each session unravelling the layers of silence that had cocooned Amy since the accident. With Axel's unwavering support, she navigated through the intricate process of reclaiming her voice, a journey fraught with challenges, yet imbued with an undercurrent of burgeoning hope. The doctor, with his expertise and compassion, had not only guided Amy on her path to recovery, but had also illuminated the power of belief and love in healing. Each small achievement in her therapy was celebrated, not just by her and Axel, but by everyone who had come to know their story. In the heart of the park, under the canopy of stars that began to twinkle in the twilight, Axel turned to Amy, his eyes reflecting the depth of his emotions. Amy, with every word you speak, you fill my world with wonder. Will you marry me? He asked, his voice a blend of hope and certainty. Tears of joy glistened in Amy's eyes as she nodded her voice a gentle melody in the evening air. Yes, Axel, a thousand times yes. And as they embraced, the world around them seemed to rejoice in their happiness, a testament to the enduring power of love and the miraculous journey from silence to a symphony of shared dreams. In that moment, they knew that no matter what the future held, they would face it together their voices united in a chorus of everlasting love.